public nemesis media. It's early 19th century, and this new ideology called nationalism is spreading across Europe. With the rise of nationalism, many groups of people on the European continent are starting their battle to have their own country, which also means rebellions against large empires ruling them. The oldest national revival in Europe, aside from French, is the Serbian National Revival, which began on February 14, 1808, with the first Serbian uprising. It marked the beginning of the struggle of Serbs against Ottoman rule, which grabbed the entire Balkan Peninsula and held it in its hands for centuries. Long story short, with more rebellions and collaborations with other Balkan people, the Serbs have slowly but successfully managed to get their freedom. Firstly, freedom came in the form of autonomy for the Principality of Serbia that came after the Second Serbian Uprising, and then an independent Serbia was recognized with the Treaty of Berlin. Uh, this treaty was signed on July 13, 1878, and it was a huge moment for the Serbs because it gave independence to not just one, but two Serbian states. The first state was, of course, the already mentioned Serbia. The second Serb state was this wonderful little place called Montenegro. Who decided to name a country Montenegro? Now, me calling Montenegro a second state of Serbs isn't a result of any of my theories, speculations, analysis, and surely not because of irredentism, which I don't have to begin with, but instead it's a result of me seeing how Montenegrins from the 19th century viewed themselves and their country. I mean, there was this one Montenegrin newspaper called Vjesnik that referred to Montenegro and Serbia as two Serbian kingdoms. And there are many more examples of Montenegro newspapers using terms like Serbs and Serbian. I can also show you the books used in Montenegro schools. Subjects you can find there include Serbian history, Serbian language, books were named Serbian grammar and Serbian primer. And if you take a look what's inside in said books, you see Montenegro stating that in Montenegro, which they called a Serbian land, was populated by pure and real Serbs. Maybe you'd like to check out the 1855 General Law of the Land titled Danilo's Code, created by the then ruler of Montenegro, Prince Danilo I. Its point number 92 stated that there's no nationality aside from Serbian in Montenegro. There's even more documents from the 19th and early 20th century made by Montenegrins where they themselves have written that they were all Serbs, but we don't want to be here all day and I believe I already proved my point. As you can already guess, these two countries were working together during good and bad times. Where there were Serbs, there were Montenegrins and vice versa. They fought together during both Balkan Wars and together they battled against Austro-Hungarian attacks during World War I. That period of time was very tough for both of them, especially when Serbia fell on 24th of November 1915, and a little later Montenegro fell on 15th of January 1916, forcing the Montenegrin king Nicholas I to escape to Italy and then to France with the Montenegrin government. The First World War would turn in favor of the Serbs and Montenegrins and by 1918 they liberated their previously lost lands. By November of 1918 they were victorious and free, which meant the opportunity to finally achieve what they planned for a long time – unification. The plan to unify Montenegro and Serbia date all the way back to September 23, 1866 when a deal for unification was made by the then Serbian prince Mihailo of the Obrenovic dynasty and the already mentioned Montenegrin prince Nicholas of the Petrovic Negros dynasty. That unification couldn't come that early because they didn't have a border and many wars in the Balkans pulled all the attention and energy so for some time, Serbs and Montenegrins had to focus on different things. 
Finally, an assembly was organized in a Montenegro city named Podgorica from 24th to 29th November of 1918 to make the unification of Serbia and Montenegro happen. The assembly was known as the Great People's Assembly of the Serb People in Montenegro, but today it's more commonly known simply as the Podgorica Assembly. The irony of this assembly was that it was going to solve the problem of separation, yet it created a brand new problem. While pretty much every Montenegrin wanted his country to unite with Serbia, they were divided on how the unification would be completed, and that was noticeable on the assembly. You basically had two groups of Montenegrins. The first group was known as Bielashi, and they were for the unconditional unification, which meant uniting into a single centralized South Slavic country. The second group was known as Zelenashi, and they were for the conditional unification, which meant uniting as a confederation in which Montenegro would have some elements of a state, its own dynasty, and control over inner policy, but still be a part of the South Slavic state. On 26th of November 1918, the Podgorica Assembly had adopted a resolution that was shortly after released under the name The Decision, which stated that Montenegro and Serbia will become one single state with other South Slavic lands under the Karadjordjevic dynasty. To put it in simple terms, the pan-Slavic idea of Pialashi I and the Petrucnegos dynasty was dethroned. As you can already guess, King Nicholas and his supporters, the Zelenashi, were very dissatisfied with that decision and refused to accept it. From 2nd to 7th of January 1919, Zelenashi have made an armed rebellion today known as the Christmas Uprising against their political opponents, Bielashi. The leaders of Zelenashi and the rebellion were Krastozernov Popovich and Jovan Simonov Plamenac, while Bielashi were led by Marko Dakovic and Andrija Radovic. The uprising, aside from being very short-lived, was a total failure, crushed quickly by Bielashi with the help from the Serbian army. Today, this event is very mystified and blown out of proportion. Some pseudo-historians try to rewrite history about this event there are also debates on whether the Podgorica assembly was legitimate or not. I won't get into any of that in this video cause it's off topic. Instead I plan to make a different video about how Montenegrin history is being falsified. With that being said, the decision to make Montenegro just some ordinary land of the centralized kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes was one of the dumbest decisions in Serbia's history. Paradoxically, putting Montenegro into a single Serbian sea started the process of separating Montenegrins from the Serbian nation and turning into a separate Montenegrin nation. The fact is, we screwed it up. So there's no point in being mad at Italians or communists or whoever else is blamed for the Montenegrin ethnic separatism. You can be mad at me all you like, but objectively, that decision to make Montenegro disappear was just plain stupid. Putting aside the uprising and dethroning of King Nicholas, the Montenegrins during the interwar period said, hey, it's great we're finally unified and all that, but can we have anything Montenegrin back? Like, please? To which King Alexander replied, well, the best we can do is make a province within the kingdom called Banovina, which doesn't really do much, but it somewhat gives an illusion that our country isn't a centralized monarchy. Also, we named your Banovina Zetska instead of Crnogorska because f you. And so, Montenegrin started breaking away. Firstly, the leftovers of the Zelenashi movement have created the Montenegrin Party, aka the Montenegrin Federalist Party in 1925. As its colloquial name could already tell you, it was a party made out of Montenegrins who wanted to recreate Montenegro in the existing Yugoslav state, 
which should become a confederation. Its president was a man named Sekula Drlevich. Originally, his separatism was only political, but as time passed by, Drlevich became more and more extreme. He would become allies with far-right movements who happened to be against the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, such as the Croatian Ustasha movement and the Italian fascist movement. The Ustasha, led by Ante Pavlic, wanted to tear apart Yugoslavia and create an independent Croatia, while fascists, led by Benito Mussolini, wanted to conquer the Adriatic coast on the Balkans. Zelenashi received support from Italy ever since the Christmas uprising, not because they really cared, but because they planned to use them in creating a Montenegrin state under Italian control. And that exactly happened in 1941, when Mussolini conquered the lands of Montenegro and made an Italian governorate of Montenegro. Sekula Drlevich and whatever was left of the Zelenashi movement would collaborate with the occupying fascist forces. During that time, the narrative of a separate Montenegrin nation and even Montenegrins never being Serbs at every point in their history was propagated. On August 30th, 1941, Drlevich held a speech on a radio in the former capital city of Montenegro, Cetinje, where he stated, quote, Montenegro, first under the name Duklia and then Zeta, existed for over 1,000 years already. No other Balkan country can brag with a life that long, except Greece. The fact that the Montenegrin people managed to keep its country throughout so many centuries is an unquestionable proof of their political wisdom. Later, in 1944, he released a book called Balkan Conflicts, where he stated, quote, Races are communities of blood, while nations are historical creations. The Montenegrin nation belongs to the Slavic community by their language, and by their blood they belong to a group of people known as the Dineric people. The people are descendants of Illyrians who have adopted the languages of other people and left their Illyrian name, but the Illyrian blood, with its geopolitical position and history, has still stayed as the creator of its culture. So basically, his theory was that Montenegrins were Illyrians who adopted a Slavic language and had a historical continuity of about 1,000 years, which meant that Montenegrins were never Serbs. Another theory I want to mention is from his close ally, Savic Markovic Štedimlija. Like Sekula Drlivic, Štedimlija didn't mention a separate Montenegro nation before the 1930s, but he was also so dissatisfied with how the unification was done, he also adopted extreme historical viewpoints. He collaborated with Zelenashi, occupying fascists and the Ustasha, and apparently he was so in love with Croats, he wrote a book in 1937 where he tried to explain that Montenegrins weren't of Serbian origin, but of Croatian. The book was titled Red Croatia, and it was based on one single source, that one being the Latin translation of the writings from Pris Duklanin, where the area of southern Dalmatia, including lands of modern-day Montenegro, was called Red Croatia. I have to clarify that it was the only document in existence that claimed there was a Red Croatia in the Balkans, and it contradicted every old writing ever made. That's right, Stedimlia found one single, very disputable source of Croats living in the land of modern Montenegro and decided to write an entire book about it. He would later repeat his weird historical viewpoint on July 5th, 1941 in his article The Free Montenegro, where he stated that Montenegrins were originally Illyrians and Croats. Also, he praised Hitler and Mussolini for being the protectors of independent Montenegro. Essentially, there was a new historical viewpoint being propagated in the so-called independent Montenegrin state during World War II that tried to completely deservify Montenegrins and their history. However, 
There was another form of Montenegrin national separatism that actually clashed with the already talked about separatism. It was the one from the Yugoslav Communist Party. The communists in Yugoslavia were also unhappy with the centralized Yugoslavia and the monarchy that ruled it. Originally, they planned to break up Yugoslavia, including the creation of an independent Montenegro, but that plan was scratched in favor of a new plan, which was taking over Yugoslavia and rebuilding it as a socialist federation. The first time they'd mention a separate Montenegro nation was at the 5th Territorial Conference held in October of 1940. Montenegrin communists have expressed their viewpoint on the self-importance of the Montenegrin nation. The wish for self-determination for Montenegrins came from the disappearance of the Montenegrin state and name in 1918. Blažo Jovanović, for example, openly and critically spoke on the 1918 unification and how it was done, which he called an injustice. The main carrier of the far-left Montenegrin ethnic separatism was a man called Milovan Gilas, who was, according to all the documents, the loudest in asking for self-determination for Montenegrins. Now, Marxists had their own theories on what is a nation, how nations are formed, and those theories would be used by people like Gilas, albeit none of them bothered to write something on the Montenegro nation before the end of World War II, like Drlevic and Sudimblia. Regardless, World War II ended in Yugoslavia with a communist victory, and their thesis on the Montenegro nation would become official in the rebuilt Socialist Federal Yugoslavia. In an issue of the Yugoslav communist newspaper Fight, released on May 1, 1945, Milovan Gilas prepared his article on the Montenegro nation titled On the Montenegro National Question. Here is what was written in that article. The Montenegrins, without a doubt, belong to the Serbian branch of South Slavic tribes and people. In the past, in the 18th and even in the beginning of the 19th century, the Serbs in Serbia were the lower class under the Turks. The Montenegrin peasants moving into other lands, especially in Serbia, have carried the spirit of resistance against Turkish feudalism. They were the carriers of Serbian traditions. With the creation of the Serbian nation, they have fused with other related peasantry. On the formation of nations, Serbian and Montenegrin, during that time, understandably, there can't even be words. However, because of the mentioned facts, the people who didn't know the laws of nation forming, pulled out a conclusion that Montenegrins are the purest Serbs, that Montenegro is the cradle of Serbdom. That served as the conceptual basis, as justification for annexing Montenegro, for challenging the national rights of Montenegrins. The creation of the nation in Montenegro started an entire century later than in Serbia. Here existed totally different in all conditions, territorial, economic connection, etc., which weren't found at the minorities in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The process of the formation of the Montenegro nation is going on to this day, and in this war, the unique Montenegrin individuality, the expression of a national conscience and the national characteristics have come to the fore most sharply. This war in a certain sense, mark the accumulation point of the process of the formation of Montenegrins into a separate nation, a separate national individuality. By tribal tradition, they feel, and they are, Serbs, but in a national sense today, they're something unique, their own, Montenegrin. We communists are not for a federal Montenegro because of some political reason nor are we tearing apart serfdom. We are for that because we're convinced it's something the Montenegrin people want, and they want that because they feel they are something unique, different Serbs from all Serbs, Montenegrins. Traditional serfdom is actually torn by those who wanted to throw dirt on it 
by collaborating with occupiers who speak on Serbs in Serbia and Montenegrins as one people, yet at the same time cut against Montenegrins in the central state apparatus, say that Montenegrins are worse than Ustashas and curse the mother of Montenegrin children who were transferred to Belgrade to be taken care of. In conclusion, Montenegrins are really connected to their fatherland. They love Montenegro very much and would rather have their own Montenegrin things because at the end of the day, they are different from other Serbs. They are Montenegrins. And you know what? I fully support the separate Montenegrin nation and Montenegrin country. That's what they want and I cannot, nor can anyone else, take that away from them. I'm still against falsifying Montenegrin history by the way. This has been a video on the Montenegrin nation and how it was formed. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. Thank you for your time. God bless and goodbye.